perspective of political philosophy and perspective because the fact is that this is a changed town, it's a changed country, and a changed world all for the better. And the purpose of this foundation really is to preserve that, not only in the interest of pure preservation, but in the interest of future dialogue among historians. And that, to me, is most laudable. I must say it appeals to my Machiavellian sense of humor to know that this facility is going to be situated in the bowels of Stanford University, which isn't really a, a bastion of conservative freedom. But in any case, uh, that is progressing well, and it'll be a magnificent site in that truly magnificent area. We've de seen demonstrated in the last several hours what Ronald Reagan's all about. Uh, there are some in the press who would say that yesterday he suffered a defeat to now introduce to you the President of the United States. Well, Paul, thank you very much. We have been friends for a long time and go back to when we shared a common border there as, with us as governors on either sides of that border. I have to apologize for being a little late coming in here today and unable to greet each one of you, but we're going to do that later. But I think you will forgive me for being late because I was with, was with Elizabeth Dole, the Secretary of Transportation, and she was handing me the check for one billion five hundred and seventy-five thousand $575 million for our sale to the public of the railroad, Conrail. So that will all be applied to the deficit. Well, Senator Blacksalt and Chairman Glenn Campbell and all of you, before I go on telling you how grateful I am, Paul interrupted me in a story. Stopped me just short of when I was going to finish. I got to finish the story. It takes place in this room. Just the other night, we were entertaining at a state dinner here, the Prime Minister of France, Prime Minister Chirac and Madame Chirac. And uh, I told her the story over there at our table in front of the fireplace, that when their president, President Mitterrand and Mrs. Mitterrand were here, you know, you it always the formula is the same. You're in the East Room down at the end of the hall. You have a receiving line. Everyone leaves there and comes down and takes their place around the tables here in this room. And then we come down, finally, when everyone is in place, and Nancy brings the president over to her table here, and I take Madam through the tables over to that table over there. And when it was the Mitterrand's turn, and we had come to the parting of the ways right here, there she stood calmly and dignified, and the butler ahead was motioning to her to come on through the tables, and I was behind her, and I leaned out and said, no, we can go through there, and she said something to me in French, which I didn't understand, and again, I did, the, and he was motioning, and just then the interpreter caught up with us. She was telling me I was standing on her gown. <laughs> I knew that I had an appreciative audience for that when I told it to Madame Chirac. <laughs> well, uh, I hope that each one of you knows how much I personally appreciate you being here and appreciate the contribution that you're all making. The primary goal of our administration has been encouraging people to get directly involved in charitable activities and community building projects. And certainly that's what this is all about. In years to come, historians will undoubtedly focus on the economic turnaround of the 1980s, the resurgence of American leadership, and the rebuilding of our military strength. Yet I would hope they don't miss the success we've had in our private sector initiatives program in mobilizing the humane and loving side of the American character. The amount of contributions to worthy causes is up 61% over these last five years. In a time of low inflation, that figure represents something to be proud of. And incidentally, speaking of the Chiracs, they have participated in something that just came about recently. And that is, uh, our in urging in Paris was held a meeting of representatives from all of our trading partners there in Europe. 
for them to learn how they too can have private initiative and have the thing that we have in this country of the private sector doing so many things that heretofore they have always left uh, to government. And uh, evidently it is succeeding very well. But uh, being individuals of means, I'm certain you've been approached for a number of worthwhile endeavors. Of course, asking for help doesn't suggest you always get it. Hey, you probably all know this story of the clergyman who was involved in a charitable campaign in his community and he called on someone who had never given before and uh, remarked about this and suggested he should be willing to do that. And the fellow said, well, you've heard about that, but he says, have you heard <clears throat> about my destitute brother, a drunkard with five children who has never been able to support them and has been unable to uh, help his, his wife? Are you aware that my father has been in a convalescent hospital for years due to an injury he received as a young workman, leaving my mother to this day with no means of support? And he went on with a couple of more examples like that. And the preacher kind of a bath said, well, I, no, I, I, I hadn't known that. Well, he said, I don't give anything to them. Why should I give something to you? <laughs> <laughs> well, there are some, and I'd say very few like that. But we can be proud that for the most part, we live among people with a magnificent sense of generosity. It's an aspect of our national personality noted as early as the 1830s when Alexis de Tocqueville, a Frenchman, toured our young country. He came here and he went back and wrote a book about democracy in America. Europe was very curious at that time as how we could have progressed so far. I'm talking about about 130 years ago. And he told that how someone here would see a problem, and they didn't call on the government. They'd cross the street and speak to a friend, and pretty soon a committee would be formed, and the next thing you know, the problem would be solved. And in his book, he says, and you won't believe this, but bureaucracy would never have any part, play any part in what they were doing. Well, you know, this strong current among our fellow citizens from every walk of life, one person this brings to mind is Andrew Carnegie. Came to this land young and poor, but managed to amass a great fortune, building our industrial might as he did so. Carnegie deeply believed in the right to make a profit and accumulate wealth, but he also preached that a heavy responsibility went with that right. Surplus wealth, he wrote, is a sacred trust which its possessor is bound to administer in his lifetime for the good of the community. Well, this emigrant from Scotland took advantage of the freedom and downless opportunity he found in the United States and did become rich. And then he enriched our country, as we all know, through his zeal for philanthropy and his love of peace. And we all know about his contributions. Among other things, he built free public libraries in cities and towns across the land, a gift that I've always thought reflected something special about this truly great American. Not that I knew him personally, mind you. I, I, <laughs> seriously, though, we haven't been able to rely on the largesse of Mr. Carnegie, but we've benefited from a group of special Americans, men and women, corporations and foundations with an appreciation for history and a desire to pass on a gift of knowledge and understanding. We want future Americans to learn from our mistakes and build on our successes. President John Adams challenged us to tenderly and kindly cherish the means of knowledge. Let us dare, he wrote, to read, think, speak, and write. Well, we Americans consider our willingness to look truth squarely in the eye as one of our nation's greatest assets. And not every country has this attitude. There's a joke among the dissidents in the Soviet Union about how frequently information concerning their history seems to change. What is a Soviet historian, they ask? And the answer, someone who can accurately predict the past. <laughs> well, with your support, we're passing on to our children a treasure of information. It'll be housed in a library with state-of-the-art audio, visual technology, and computer craft. In the end, what we're building together will be a preeminent resource for scholarly research. It'll be a lasting gift. Because as another American president once noted, 
Ideas are the only thing in this universe that are immortal. James Garfield said that, and I didn't know him either. So today I'd like to thank each of you from my heart for the honor that you do me and for the inheritance you're helping us to leave for those who will follow. Let us hope that when this administration is over and decades from now young scholars are poring over the documents of our time, they'll think highly of us and know that we had them in mind. I want to thank you all again from the bottom of my heart, and God bless all of you. And now, because I didn't get to say hello uh, in any but a hurried way to a few of you, I'm going to go out through this door, through the red room, down to the blue room, and I'm going to be standing there in front of the fireplace waiting for you to come by so that I can say a hello and a thank you to each one of you. Again, God bless you all. Thank you.